All right, we will do a reading of The Stolen Basilisk by H.G. Wells. This again, said the bacteriologist, slipping a glass slide under the microscope is a preparation of the celebrated Basilisk of cholera, the cholera germ. The pale-faced man peered down the microscope. He was evidently not accustomed to that kind of thing and held a limp white hand over his disengaged eye. I see very little, he said. Touch this screw, said the bacteriologist. Perhaps the microscope is out of focus for you. Eyes vary so much. Just the fraction of a turn this way or that. Ah, now I see, said the visitor. Not so much to see after all. Little streaks, streaks and shreds of pink. And yet those little particles, those mere atomies, might multiply and devastate a city. Wonderful. He stood up and releasing this glass slip from the microscope, held it in his hand towards the window. Scarcely visible, he said, scrutinizing the preparation. He hesitated. Are these alive? Are they dangerous now? Those have been stained and killed, said the bacteriologist. I wish, oops, I wish for my own part, we could kill and stain every one of them in the universe. I suppose the pale-faced man said with a slight smile that you can, that you scarcely care to have such things about you in the living, in the active state. On the contrary, we are obliged to. And obliged, ooh, I'm going to put that because we would know obliged means that they have to. And that, obviously the story was published in the late 1800s, but like, why would scientists be obliged to keep bacteria in their home? That seems kind of odd to me. And then the other thing, so we have the point of view here um, of only one character as of now, the bacteriologist, right? All right, and here's our word, so obliged. And we, so we know the point of view of our bacteriologist, but we don't even know the name yet. So what is this pale-faced man doing at this bacteriologist guy's house talking about um, bacteria devastating a water supply and being a wonderful thing? Okay. Um, he says, we are obliged to. Here, for instance, he walked across the room and took up one several sealed tubes. Here is a living thing. This is a cultivation of the actual living disease bacteria, he hesitated, bottled cholera, so to speak. A slight gleam of satisfaction appeared moment momentarily in the face of the pale man. It's a deadly thing to have in your possession, he said, devouring the little tube with his eyes. Bacteriologists watched the morbid pleasure in his visitor's expression. The man who had visited him that afternoon with a note of introduction from an old friend interested him from the very contrast of their dispositions the lank black hair and deep gray eyes the haggard expression the nervous manner the fitful yet keen interest in his visitor were a novel change from the phlegmatic deliberations of the ordinary scientific worker with whom the bacteriologist chiefly associated it was perhaps natural with a hair with a hearer evidently so impressionable to the lethal nature of his topic to take the most effective aspect of the matter. So this is the point of view of the bacteriologist. And he's saying that the only reason he's even talking to this pale faced man, this pale faced stranger who showed up with a note from one of the bacteriologist's friend that said, hey, this is my friend, let him into your laboratory. He is saying that the only reason he's even entertaining this guy, the pale-faced man, is because it's nice to have somebody interested and, like, impressed with his vials and his microscopes. He held the tube in his hand thoughtfully. Yes, here is a pestilence imprisoned. Only break such a little tube as this into a supply of drinking water, say to these minute particles of light that one must needs stain and examine with the highest powers of the microscope even to see, and that one can either smell 
nor taste say to them, go forth, increase and multiply and replenish the cisterns and death, mysterious and traceable death, swift and del terrible death, full of pain and indignity would be released upon this city and go hither and thither seeking his victims. Here he would take the husband from the wife, here the child from its mother, here the statesman from its duty, and here the toilet from his trouble. He would follow the water mains, creeping along streets, picking out and punishing a house here and a house there where they did not boil their drinking water, creeping into the wells of the mineral water makers, getting washed into salad and lying dormant on ices. He would wait, ready to be drunk in the horse troughs, and by unwary children in the public fountains, he would soak into the soil to reappear in the springs and wells at a thousand unexpected places. Once start him at the water supply, and before we could ring him in and catch him again, he would have decimated the metropolis. This is a very big line of a specific type of figurative language that we will talk about later unless you want to try to guess now and then wait there was another one up here piece of figurative language it would have been let's see his haggard expression no here is pestilence imprisoned that's also figurative language we'll do that one after okay i'll keep going he's Stopped abruptly. He had been told rhetoric was his weakness. Rhetoric just means talking too much. But he is quite safe here, you know, quite safe. The pale-faced man nodded, his eyes shone, he cleared his throat. These anarchist rascals, said he, are fools, blind fools, to use bombs when this kind of thing is attainable. Ooh. Now we have our first mention. An anarchist is... Anarchy is this, if you ever heard somebody say something was anarchy, anarchy was a political ideology that just said that there should be absolutely no form of government. And it was kind of like the first terrorist attacks, you could say. Um, all right, said he, are fools, blind fools to use bonds when this kind of thing is attainable, I think. A gentle rap, a mere light touch of the fingernails was heard at the door. The bacteriologist opened it. Just a minute, dear, whispered his wife. When he re-entered the laboratory, his visitor was looking at his watch. I had no idea I'd waste an hour of your time, he said. Twelve minutes before, I ought to have left here by half past three. But your things were really too interesting. No, possibly, I cannot stop a moment longer. I have an engagement at four. He passed out of the room, reiterating his thanks, and the bacteriologist accompanied him to the door, and then returned thoughtfully along the passage to his laboratory. He was musing on the ethnology of his visitor. Certainly the man was not a Teutonic type nor a common Latin one. A morbid product, anyhow, I am afraid, said the bacteriologist to himself. How he gloated on those cultivations of disease germs. A disturbing thought struck him. He turned to the bench by the vapor bath and then very quickly took his writing table. Then he felt hastily in his pockets and then rushed to the door. I may have put it down on the hall table, he said. Minnie, he shouted hoarsely in the hall. Yes, dear, came a remote voice. Had I anything in my hand when I spoke to you, dear, just now? Pause. Nothing, dear, because I remember. Blue ruin, cried the bacteriologist, and incontently, incontinently ran to the front door and down the steps of his house to the street. Minnie, hearing the door slam violently, ran in alarm to the window down the street a slender man was getting into the cab the bacteriologist hatless and in his in his carpet slippers was running and gush gestulating gestulating that would be like this ah, wildly towards his group one slipper came off but he did not wait for it he has gone mad said minnie it's that horrid science of his and opening the window would have called after him the slender man suddenly glancing around seemed struck with the same idea of mental disorder he pointed hastily to the bacteriologist said something to the cabman the apron of the cat slam the whip swished the horse's feet clattered and in a moment cab 
in a moment cab and bacteriologists hotly in pursuit had receded up the vista of the roadway and disappeared around the corner. Minnie remained straining out of the window for a minute. Then she drew her head back into the room again. She was dumbfounded. Of course he is eccentric, she mediated. But running about London in the height of the season, too, in his socks, a happy thought struck her. She hastily put her bonnet on, seized his shoes, went into the hall, took down his hat and light overcoat from the pegs, emerged upon the doorstep and hailed a cab that opportunely, opportunely crawled by, Drive me up the road and round Havelock Crescent and see if we can find a gentleman running about in a velveteen coat and no hat. The height of the season would have been like when everyone in London of like a higher society would be going out and doing things like the spring summer. Velveteen coat, ma'am, and no app. Very good, ma'am. This is supposed to be dialect and I can't do it. So I apologize. It's just showing that they were um, like London um, city folk, like working class people. Um, the cab swooped up at once in the most matter of fact way as he drove to this address every day in his life. Some few minutes later, the little group of cabmen and loafers that collect around the cabman's shelter at Haverstock Hill were startled by the passing of a cab with a ginger-colored screw of a horse driven furiously. They were silent as it went by, and then as it receded, "'That's Harry X. What's he got?' said the stout gentleman known as Old Tootles. "'He's a-using his whip. He is too right,' said the ostler boy. "'Oh,' said poor old Tommy Biles. "'Here's another bloomin' lunatic. Blowed if there ain't.' It's old George, said old Tootles, and he's driving a lunatic, as you say. Ain't he a clon out of the cab? Wonder if he's at the Rary Hicks. The group round the cabman's shelter became animated. Chorus, go it, George. It's a race. You'll catch him. Whip up. She's a goer, she is, said the oldster boy. Strike me giddy, cried old Tootles. Here I'm a-going to be again in a minute. Here's another coming. If all the cubs in Hepstead ain't gone mad this morning. It's a field mail this time, said the oldster boy. She's a-following em, said old Tootles. Usually the other way about. What she got in her hand? Looks like a hat. <laughs> what a bloomin' lark is it? <laughs> Three to one on old George, said oldster boy. Next, Minnie went by in a perfect roar of applause. She did not like it. But she felt that she was doing her duty and whirled on down Haverstock Hill and Camden Town. High Street, with her eyes ever intent on the animated back view of old George, who was driving her vagrant husband so incomprehensibly away from her. The man in the foremost cab sat crouched in the corner, his arms tightly folded, and the little tube that contained such vast possibilities of destruction gripped his hand. His mood was a singular mixture of fear and exhaustion. Chiefly, he was afraid of being caught before he could accomplish his purpose. But behind this was a vaguer, was a vaguer but larger fear of the awfulness of his crime, but his exultation far exceeded his fear. No anarchist before him had ever approached this conception of his. Ravachol, Vailan, all those distinguished persons whose fame he had envied dwindled into insignificance beside him. He had only known he had only to make sure of the water supply and the break the little tube into a reservoir. A reservoir is a place that holds water. How brilliantly he had planned it, forged the letter of introduction and got into the laboratory, and how brilliantly he had seized his opportunity. The world should hear of him at last. All those people who had snared at him, neglected him, preferred other people to him, found his company undesirable, should consider him at last. Death, death, death. They had always treated him as a man of no importance. All the world had been in a conspiracy to keep him under. He would teach them yet what it is to isolate a man. What was this familiar street? Great St. Andrew's Street, of course. How far the chase. He craned out of the cab. The bacteriologist was scarcely 50 yards behind. That was bad. He would be caught and stopped yet. He felt in his pocket for money and found a half sovereign. This he thrust through, thrust up through the trap in the top of the cab into the man's face. 
More, he shouted, if only we get away. The money was snatched out of his hand. Right you are, said the cabman, and the trap slammed. The lash lay among along the glistening side of the horse. The cab swayed, and the anarchist, half standing under the trap, put the hand containing the little glass tube upon the apron to preserve his balance. He felt the brittle thing crack, and broken half of it rang upon the floor of the cab. He fell back into the seat with a curse and stared dismally at the two or three drops of moisture on the apron. He shuddered. Well, I suppose I shall be the first few. Anyhow, I shall be a martyr. That's something, but it is a filthy death nevertheless. I wonder if it hurts as much as they say. Presently, a thought occurred to him. He groped between his feet. A little drop was still in the broken end of the tube, and he drank that to make sure. It was better to make sure. At any rate, he would not fail. Then it dawned upon him that there were no further need to escape the bacteriologist. In Wellington Street, he told the cabman to stop and get out. He slipped down the step, and his head felt queer. It was rapid stuff, this cholera poison. He waved his cabman out of existence, so to speak, and stood on the pavement with his arms folded up, his breast awaiting the arrival of the bacteriologist. There was something tragic in his pose. The sense of imminent death gave him a certain dignity. All right, for this one, what had happened? He drank the cholera. And a martyr would be somebody who dies for a cause. So when the cab, because this would be a horse-drawn cab, so it would be kind of rickety. Um, When the cab turned, it broke the vial. And now he assumes that he's going to die of cholera, which is not a good death. Um, And then now he's made a decision. Also, important to note that the point of view of our story switched. The whole first two, three pages was the point of view of the bacteriologist. And now it has switched this page. We get the point of view of the anarchist. And he's no longer the pale-faced man. Notice now they're referring to him as, Wells is referring to him as the anarchist. Vive, anarchy, you are too late, my friend. I have drunk it. The cholera is abroad. The bacteriologist came from his the bacteriologist came from his cab beamed curiously at him with his spectacles you have drunk it an anarchist i see now he was about to say something more and then checked himself a smile hung in the corner of his mouth he opened the apron of his cab as if to descend at which the anarchist waved him a dramatic farewell and strode off towards the Waterloo Bridge, carefully jostling his infected body against as many people as possible. The bacteriologist was so preoccupied with the vision of him that he scarcely manifested the slightest surprise at the appearance of Minnie upon the pavement with his hat and shoes and overcoat. Very good of you to bring my things, he said, and remained lost in contemplation of the receding figure of the anarchist. You had better get in, he said, still staring. Minnie felt absolutely convinced now that he was mad and directed the cabman home on her own responsibility. Put on my shoes, certainly, dear, said he as the cab began to turn and hid the strutting black figure now small in the distance from his eyes. Then suddenly something grotesque struck him and he laughed. Then he remarked, "It it is really very serious, though. You see that man came to my house to see me, and he is an anarchist. No, don't faint, or I cannot possibly tell you the rest. And I wanted to astonish him, not knowing he was an anarchist, and took up a cultivation of that new species of bacterium I was telling you of, that infest, and I think caused the blue patches upon various monkeys. And like a fool, I said it was Asiatic cholera, And he ran away with it to poison the water of London. And he certainly might have made things look blue for this civilized city. And now he has swallowed it. Of course I cannot say what will happen. But you know it turned that kitten blue and three puppies in patches and the sparrow bright blue. But the bother is I shall have all the trouble and expense of preparing some more. 
put on my coat on this hot day. Why? Because we might meet Mrs. Jabber. My dear Mrs. Jabber is not a draft. But why should I wear a coat on a hot day because of Mrs. Oh, very well. The ending is supposed to be like, she didn't listen to anything he said. Um, And I guess you could say, and then he's like responding to her because he said all of this stuff. How an anarchist came to their house, stole his cholera, what he thought was. And he's like very unbothered by this whole situation. And not only that, when that guy jumped into the river, well, first of all, cholera doesn't spread person to person. It spreads through the water supply. So him jostling and trying to like infect people was meaningless. But the other part, he jumped in the water and it is implied that he killed himself for this cause because he called himself a martyr. And... The bacteriologist seems very unbothered by this, but we will explore the story's literary elements in our next lessons.